Here we are then. <clears throat> Here is Mark. Come to tell you uh, all about this uh, SVG widget, I believe. And um, I, I hear that he has something very exciting to share anyway. I've heard rumors. So I am going to hand you over to Mark as soon as somebody confirms that they can see and hear us. Um, just going to, uh, yep, Brian says yes. Yes, we're here. And Sean, this is good. They're coming in, they're coming in in the droves. Yep, yep, here we are, here's Terry. Okay, take it away, Mark. What have you got for us? Okay, well, hello, everyone. Um, I'm back again this month, and this month I'm gonna be talking about building an SVG widget. So as has happened with the previous two uh, sessions I've done, I've not had a chance to record any videos beforehand, so this is all live. Um, I have got a script that I'll be uploading to the resources folder for this particular session um, after the event, as well as a, a deliverable for you to play with as well. So without further ado, let me um, get on with my talk. Okay, so as, as everyone probably knows, this is about building an SVG widget. This was a, a talk that was meant to be, I think, two months ago, but we had to reschedule. Um, I've now finally um, got uh, an SVG widget to share and talk about, so that is what I'm going to do. Okay, so let's start with a bit of an introduction. So first of all, I just want to chat a bit about vector graphics in general. Now, um, I call this like the modern rise of vector graphics because in reality, vector graphics has been around since the when we first started displaying um, graphics on a computer screen. Indeed, the very first displays that were attached to computers were line oriented. Indeed, they were derived from oscilloscopes. Um, so every frame was refreshed, you'd actually have the cathode ray gun drawing lines on the display. It wasn't raster based, it wasn't pixel based, it was all line oriented. Of course, things moved on with home computers and everything got raster displays, which were generally um, much more efficient for that time because of CPU speeds and memory speeds and all that kind of stuff. Um, so kind of vector graphics kind of reduced slightly in terms of the way we display stuff for a long time. Of course, they've always been very important in print and publishing. Um, obviously, Adobe in particular, the creation of PostScript kind of drove that industry hugely in terms of automating print typesetting and design. So in recent years, of course, vector graphics have started to become increasingly more important. And that's probably mainly because we finally have those high density screens that we've been promised for like 20 years. So if you go back 15 years, screens were still pretty small. Like you have like uh, 1600 by 1200 is a pretty typical resolution unless you had vast amounts of money to spend on very, very high end uh, workstations. Because now my phone has a got larger actual device pixel resolution from that. So now looking at, we need to provide images that are not only say four times as many pixels as they had before, but in some cases nine. And I very much suspect that's going to continue as time goes by. So if we look now, if you're producing app now for modern iPhones, you could be looking at having to create images with total numbers of pixels 14 times as many as you would have done a decade ago. So this is actually a huge, huge increase in the resource size for modern applications. And it's also a right pain to actually generate them. So we want to move to vector graphics. So just a couple of ideas about what vector graphics is about. Usually vector graphics because it to be a tree of elements. So you have a root node in the tree and then um, it has child elements that describe um, how the graphics lays up, very much like the object tree you get in live code. Typically, um, the way you describe vector graphics, all elements are described as vector paths. Um, so these are very simple expressions that say kind of moving an invisible pen around. So you move to a point. You can then draw a line to a point. You can then draw a curve through points. They're usually Bayesian curves, either quadratic or cubic, which means you have one or two control points. And then usually vector paths have this idea of subparts. You can actually have multiple subparts in a single path. And they are filled depending on the direction of the paths in relation to each other and depending on a rule. So typically paths can be filled or stroked. So filling means you fill all the thing, all the pixels considered to be inside the path. Whereas stroking is a more geometric operation. You, just, you thicken the outline of the path with the width, you apply line caps, joins, potentially dash it, and then you fill the thickened outline. Um, so in terms of actually painting, uh, you don't tend to think in terms of like individual pixels, instead you tend to think of something called paints. So a paint is an abstraction that describes how you fill something algorithmically. So typical paints, you find are solid colors, you find gradients, you also find patterns as well, which typically take raster images to fill and tile an area with. Now, 
that's actually the way you actually do images in vector graphics as well, because a an image being displayed is simply a rectangle that's been filled with a, an image pattern at the size of the rectangle. So finally, particularly in the modern um, world, uh, I think certainly PostScript added transparency and compositing support, I think it was about 15, 20 years ago. Um, you also can then blend these elements together by changing the opacity of each element and then using composition operations to actually uh, mix the pixels together. So things like um, blend source over is the typical one. That basically just means you mix them on top of each other. It's a natural one to use. There's also others. There's things like multiply. There's um, hard light, soft light, and some more complex ones that do provide other effects. So here we have some examples. These three um, <clears throat> things on the screen are actually vector graphics images. I just found them on Google. Um, the uh, tiger on the right might well be familiar. That's long been a, an example of SVG. Um, <clears throat> so indeed, these were just actually raster images I, I grabbed off of Google and put into the spreadsheet. They are at, into the, my slides. They are actually SVG files in the source. So in terms of vector graphics formats, obviously you need to have a, a format or a standard way to describe vector graphics to be able to communicate and exchange them. So most vector illustration programs always had, always had proprietary formats. So Adobe Illustrator has its own file format, Corel Draw had its own file format, Artworks and um, what became Zara Studio um, had its own file format. Um, however, there's always PostScript um, has always been lurking around the background as a kind of universal format, although for a long time it was kind of restricted to the high-end typesetting and stuff like that industry, uh, partly because Adobe's licensing fees are so huge. Obviously, over time, um, other emulations came about and such. So most color printers today, for example, will actually use some form of PostScript as their uh, way your computer talks to them. And obviously, PostScript has now been distilled down to something called PDF. So PDF differs from PostScript because it's, uh, it doesn't have any execution ability, whereas PostScript is actually a programming language. Post PDF is just a page description language. Now, neither PostScript nor PDF are really ideal as they are really more designed for output. They're designed to hold and archive the representation of a printed page after it's been rendered. You don't even meant to edit them afterwards. Of course, you can tweak them, you can add elements and stuff like that, but in terms of editing the actual underlying structure is actually quite difficult. So here we now enter SVG. SVG is basically designed as a human readable and writable format, um, which kind of solves a number of problems. And indeed, increasingly, uh, more and more vector illustration programs and for a number of years have been outputting SVG as an option. Indeed, because of the way SVG actually works, um, things like Sodipodi and Inkscape can actually put attributes into an SGV file after you save it to remember any state the SVG can't record. So pretty much you can actually use it as the file format for a vector illustration program. Okay, so the goal of the SVG widget and the goal of what we're trying to do here is we want to be able to use vector graphics files directly as a replacement for raster image files. So essentially what we want to be able to do is rather than have to perhaps get a designer to design our icons and stuff like that as vector files then give them to us and then we have to go through a process of rendering them at different sizes and then putting them into our application as resources, we want to be able to take the, the vector graphics file produced by a designer or whoever and put it straight into our app and the app then just uses that. Of course, the advantage here is that you ship one file on one representation of your image, and then the application can render that at any size required. So if it's rendering on a, a device which has a standard non-retina screen, it just produces that many pixels and that resolution. If it's rendering on one of the latest iPhones, which have three or four times the number of um, device pixels, then it'll render four times, or oh, sorry, sorry, up to nine times as many pixels, it'll render nine times as many pixels to give you a much crisper result. Okay, so now I'll go on to introducing scalable vector graphics. I'm sure most people have heard of it, but I'll just give you a little overview. So SVG is what um, the W3C and everyone else calls an application of XML. Essentially, it means that it's a format which uses XML as its transmission medium. So SVG is described using standard XML structure. You have elements, you have attributes. Um, all, there's all the kind of complexity of XML coming to play in terms of entity reference, all that kind of stuff. It has evolved a very similar concept as HTML and CSS. Indeed, it, it uses a lot of them. Um, the styling ideas come from CSS. Um, the way it's defined and specified is very similar to HTML and CSS. Obviously, it's all coming out of W3C. So they have a very, very consistent way they describe and um, document their formats. Like most specifications, it's a de it, uh, the SVG is a declarative format rather than imperative. So what I mean by that is rather than um, listing the instructions to do something, you kind of describe 
how things are going to be done. So that's in contrast to PostScript, which really is a programming language. Um, <clears throat> SVG is not, it's just a very rich descriptive language for vector graphics. Now, SVG has been around a long time. So it was the first version one was standardized in 2001. And um, there's been a few other revisions throughout the last uh, 15 years. The originally 1.1 was going to evolve into 1.2. Um, that was in a draft for a long time, but they basically gave up on it. And now that's been replaced by a draft process for version two. What did come out of version 1.2 was a something called SVG Tiny, which was a much smaller, much more constrained specification as a subset of um, a slightly evolved 1.1 standard that was much easier to implement and was particularly targeted for mobile devices and other kind of low, uh, low power computing devices. Um, because the thing is, when it first came out in 2001, it was a very aspirational specification. I remember reading, I think I first read, I think it was 1.1 spec in 2003 or perhaps a year or two afterwards. It's huge, it's large, complicated, and requires very, very significant amount, very, very powerful, like underlying rasterization library to actually implement. Um, I'm not sure when browsers starting to support SVG well, but I don't think it was much more before four or five years ago. So basically, the full of SVG is a very large and very complicated specification. However, you can produce some really beautiful graphics with it. So again, as I said before, one huge advantage of SVG is that it's human readable and writable. Now, indeed, it's actually a really good format to actually generate by code. So, for example, there's various uh, graphics, uh, sorry, graph um, components for the web, which actually produce SVG, which you can then basically just embed directly into your web page, and it can do that dynamically. Um, <clears throat> I think this is partly related to it being based on XML, because obviously XML is a very well understood format. It's easy to read and it's easy to write, particularly all the XML libraries that exist out there. OK, so let's have a look at a few SVG examples. So here's a really simple one. It's like three um, RGB circles overlapping. So you can see in the, in the text on the right, that's the actual SVG that does that. So you see in the top element, you have a view box, which describes the, um, the area of the SVG which should be rendered in the client. And that's used to define a transform and scale it or uh, into the bounds of whatever you're rendering into. There's a group um, element, and the group element uh, basically contains a collection of other elements, and it, it renders them together. On each element, you can specify a style attribute. So a style attribute is CSS styles, or you can also specify all the styles also as normal XML attributes. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, it's saying that all the, all the, con all the contents of the uh, group should be rendered with a fill opacity of 0.7, they should be stroked with black and with a stroke width of 0.1 centimeters. So inside that, you can see that there's some shape elements. So circle does the obvious thing, it renders a circle. Here you also see there's a transform. So you can apply arbitrary, what's called affine 2D transformations. It basically means you can describe by a number, by at most six numbers, how to scale, rotate, skew, or translate your element. Now, SVG makes this quite simple. You don't have to actually compute the matrices yourselves. You can just uh, list like scale, translate, rotate in the transform attribute. That's, again, there's another reason why it's quite easy to have write by hand. Uh, here's another example. This one kind of goes a long way back. Uh, it's the SVG Tiger. Um, I've not got the whole SVG description here because it's obviously quite big. It's quite a complicated um, SVG. You see here similar things. There's a, there's a path element there, which is introduced. So an element, a path element um, allows you to describe a path, as I said before, using things like move to, line to, curve to. Um, and the SG, SVG path description language is quite rich. And Live Code has actually supported that um, ever since we added the Canvas module to LCB. And it's what the SVG icon widget uses. And finally, here's another example. It's a world map. Again, this one's really quite a complicated SVG. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure this has got anything particularly interesting in this bit here beyond the others. But here you see kind of matrices are being just, uh, described in full. You've got kind of the stroke width, stroke might and limit, all these things being set. Um, you also see here there's an ID attribute on uh, the element. So you can label any node or any element in your SVG with an ID which allows you to reference it from elsewhere. So there's actually something called the use node in SVG, which basically when it's actually run or when SVG is displayed, the use node gets replaced with a copy of the element it references. So this makes it easy to create an SVG that replicates an element many, many, many times without having to copy paste. OK, so I've already mentioned a few, but it's a, a, the overview of SVG. As I said, it's a, it's very similar instruction ideas that use an HTML and CSS. It's just focused on uh, 2D vector graphics rather than um, text content and layout. So all SVG documents start with the root element of SVG. 
There's a defs element, which allows you to hide and not render a collection of elements that you're referencing elsewhere. There's a use element, which can reference another element, and it will replace itself with that other element. Um, G allows you to group elements together. So for example, you can reference a group of elements rather than just a single element. Path rep represents a standard 2D vector path using the SVG path language. And then you have um, shape elements, rep, circle, ellipse, line, polygon, polyline. So SVG has many more elements than this. You can, in the full SVG specification, you can find gradients of various types. You can do text and various other things. So um, there's one thing. So there's also there's the attributes you can set on the XML nodes. Now I'll just make a point here. Um, there's just to try and make things clear. Um, SVG is rendered as an XML document. So every element has XML attributes. However, from SVG's point of view, there's actually a slight difference between things called properties and things called um, attributes. So I, I'm referring to attributes and properties as used by SVG as features. And um, I'll come on to that in a minute. So if you see features, I actually mean uh, basically it's an XML attribute, which could be a property or attribute as seen from the SVG specifications point of view. So I mentioned these, there's a transform, there's the, the fill stroke, stroke capacity, fill rule, then stroke attributes, and then there's an ID attribute. Again, there's many more attributes. There are attributes which are specific to elements, attributes that cascade, and um, various other things and bits and pieces that are, are present. Okay, so I'll just take a brief moment there to see if there's any questions. So, okay. Don't seem to have any questions, so I shall carry on. Okay, so let's um, now start talking about how we go about designing an SVG widget. Okay, so as I said at the start, the full SVG specification, SVG 1.2, I think, is, I can't remember whether SVG 1.2, so SVG 1.1 is the current full specification that exists. SVG 1.1 is a very large specification. SVG 1.2 was going to be even bigger, but more modular. And SVG 2 is now replacing um, full 1.2, and that's set to be at least equal size 1.1, but hopefully slightly better defined. One of the big issues with SVG in the early days was that there was a fair bit of hand waving in the specification, and not not everything was very explicitly defined. Um, it, things have got a lot better. I've noticed they've uh, tightened up a great many things in the SVG specification too, uh, like explicitly detailing precisely how paths should be rendered and what should happen, for example, if you have a dash length of zero and stuff like that. Um, these all things may sound like kind of rather small issues, but in actual fact, when you want a format that allows you to replicate it identically on any device or any implementation, it's really important the specification defines in detail every single edge case that can exist. Um, <clears throat> so, we can look to browsers for the current frontier support for SVG, I think. So most modern browsers, particularly Chrome, I suspect, and Safari, have ex exceptionally good support for SVG in full specification 1.1. Um, they provide the full implementation. It's interactive. You can, it provides all the animation support. It's scriptable with JavaScript, and it has a full document object model, including mutability, which means you can actually manipulate it at runtime. Of course, that kind of thing comes at a great cost in terms of development time, the code size, the execution time of actually rendering and manipulating the SVG and the resource usage at runtime. Um, as I said, it's taken many years for browsers to get to the point where they fully support SVG, even close to fully support SVG. So kind of when I scratch my head, well, what do we actually aim for? I had to cut the problem down slightly. If the goal is for us to use SVG to replace images, so the, the first thing we want to aim for is we want to aim to be able to do it using as little memory as possible and to render as fast as possible. This means you can basically then look at um, <clears throat> replacing all your images that are currently provided as uh, PNGs, for example, which could be vectors. Obviously, you can't really do a photo as a vector graphics file, but certainly most icons can be done as um, SVG kind of files. Then it makes sense to make sure we have, at least in the first pass implementation, or first pass uh, widget for this, it does one thing, does it very well, which is basically render the SVG as quickly as possible. So. My current SVG was entirely focused on rendering. Now, there are some stuff we can probably do with this at a later date, that we probably add some interactivity. So for like hit testing of shapes and stuff, I think uh, someone was asking a while back how they might implement an interactive map, where you just wanted a mouse to tell what uh, country the mouse was over. In the future, we could look at adding that to the widget, because that's not really, that's not exactly interactivity, it's merely hit detection. We can also look at adopting animation as well. Um, which again, isn't really interactive. It's just merely changing uh, various properties in the SVG over time. However, in the first instance, I'm looking at static rendering of SVG files. 
Okay, so before we go any further, we kind of need to reduce the problem, think about how we're going to attack it. Now, in this case, we have a very high level description of something, i an SVG document, which describes a vector graphics picture. We want it to um, be able to execute and run in very little storage and very little time. And when you think about this, it very sounds very much like the programming language implementation problem. So a programming language, you have source files, which is a very high level description of how to, execute, how to write and program. Um, and you want it to run in as minimal storage and as fast as possible. So the pattern that's used there to solve that problem is what you might call the compile execute pattern. So you compile your high level description to something much more low level, and you design the low level representation to be something you can execute quickly. Now in the case of compilers, particularly native code compilers like C, obviously the, the low level description is fixed for you. It's the machine code it generates. But then you see other things like um, many uh, interpreted languages like, uh, well, many non-native code languages, I say, will still compile, but they'll compile to an intermediate representation, which is just a great deal faster to execute than the source code would be. So the Likert engine does this, the scripts are compiled before they're executed. Um, I think if I'm correct, the original hypercard used direct interpretation of the scripts, which was always quite slow in comparison to the first version of Metacard, which did a compile step for executing, and Metacard was generally a great deal quicker. So this is the kind of uh, balance you get. Um, so it's a very similar problem. So let's adopt that pattern for this. What we'll do is we'll write a compiler which takes the a high level SVG document with all its complexity and tries to reduce it down to a simple low level form. We will design the low level form to make sure it can be um, executed really, really quickly and in very little memory. And we'll then write an interpreter which executes that low level form quickly. Okay, so now we've decided we're gonna split the problem up into to use those compile execute pattern. What do we actually need to do? Well, we need a compact intermediate format, which is suitable for execution. We need a compiler that allows us to take the SVG input documents and translates them to the intermediate form. We then need a processor which can execute that intermediate format. And then we need a widget which actually wraps these two things together so you can actually just use it from live code by dragging it out from the tools palette and setting the SVG text. Sounds simple, hey? Okay, so I'll just pause there for a moment and see if there are any questions. Okay, so I do not seem to, so I will proceed. Okay, so now we've decided on how we're going to attack the problem. Let's have a look at the implementation. Okay, so the first thing is let's decide on our intermediate format. Now, for those of you who've um, been around computers for many years and used Windows 3.1 and Windows 95 and uh, Mac before it went on Mac OS X, you might recall things called graphics meta files. So Windows has all the enhanced meta file format uh, Mac had picked. So what a graphics meta file is, it's basically a recording of graphics API calls you make. So for example, um, GDI, which is the graphics API on Windows, or the, the, the native one, that's kind of being replaced by GDA plus and other things now. Like I think it's direct draw 2D or something is the current best one to use. It gives you all the fancy anti-aliasing everything. But GDI is very much a, a simple, draw rectangles, circles, um, text, all this kind of stuff. So EMF files, basically you could record your graphics operations into a meta file. And all that did was it recorded all the information needed to replay those calls at a later date. So this is exactly the same kind of thing we want to do here. Um, indeed, when one sits and thinks about, and read the SVG spec a couple of times and pondered it and thought about um, what the SVG is actually doing, what it comes down to is simple SVG, and I define simple SVG, <clears throat> to be um, basically things that are only composed of paths, fills, opacity changes, and stroke attributes. So that's not including things like um, transparent layers, clipping recs, and things like that. Um, if you ignore all those other things, which are a bit more complicated, then you can basically render an SVG file by making a sequence of calls called path, which take the path you want to render, how you want to transform that path, the paints you want to use for filling and stroking and the other attributes. So basically you could uh, render an SVG file with that API and what you'd end up if you were recording that would be a list of calls to path. And you can kind of start to see that that would be quite easy to record as a data file which you can then load and play back later. And that's precisely what a meta file is. Now, the thing about that kind of call is actually really quite large and isn't very compact. The thing is that the majority of the time you make far more path you render paths far more often than you change attributes. So the first thing you do to ensure you have a much more compact format is you pull out state changes from rendering. So instead, 
you have several commands. So you have a transform command that sets the tra current transform. You have paint commands that set the, the current paint for filling and stroking. You have opacity commands and you have attribute commands. <clears throat> so with this, um, what you end up with is you, you can basically produce the output of an SGE file by basically making a long series of calls to state changes and path rendering functions. Now, there's other things I mentioned, like transparency layers and clipping and that kind of stuff. You can still do, do it using a meta file. You just need to add a couple of other operations. For example, begin and end is what you'd add for transparency layers, which would signal, I now want to create a new buffer to render into a different size with this transform. And then the, all your operations get rendered into that buffer. And then when, that's, when end is hit, it then composites that into the parent. Um, if you want clipping, then you just need to have an idea of clip state, which is a path. And other things can all be done like that. There is simply nothing in SVG that cannot be rendered in this kind of idea using a, uh, a set of atomic operations that manipulate state and then perform graphics operations. Uh, indeed, for anyone familiar with PostScript, you'll know this to be absolutely true because that's precisely how PostScript works. All the PostScript operators are basically things like this. You set state and then you call stroke. Is it EO fill, um, fill, stroke, and that kind of thing, those operators to actually render your marks on the page. Okay, so another thing I should point behind here, once you've done all this, what ends up happening is the transformations you're making, the paints you're using, a paint is like a color, a gradient or something like that, something that provides pixel values to put inside paths and paths, they all become constant objects. Um, <clears throat> they're fixed at the point you actually compile the SVG. Okay, so um, and I'll quickly go through the ideas how the compiling actually works. So as a, I've got a script that says a bit, goes into a bit more detail about this. However, as I said, one, one thing I said before was um, the W3C produces really quite good specifications. However, like most specifications, they are declarative in their way they're written. They don't tell you how to do something. They just describe the effects of what these things should do. So the first thing that you have to do is try and understand the process by which you can actually do what the things are telling you or the specifications telling you. This is sometimes not an entirely uh, easy task. Um, <clears throat> And I have to say, in terms of SVG, it is quite a large specification, and there's there's a few things seem to make perfect sense if you read the first part, are they? You can do something like this, and then you get to an element type that has a slightly different thing. It does slightly different. You realize, well, actually, okay, no, that doesn't quite work. However, after several iterations, um, you kind of kind of distill out the fundamental concepts and then um, a method of actually doing it. So this is kind of what I've done uh, recently. So the first, the fundamental concept you kind of have in uh, SVG, I have elements, which are nodes in the XML tree. You have attributes. Now, these are XML attributes on the elements that are specific to that element. So, for example, the path element has a D attribute. In comparison, in contrast, properties are also XML attributes, which can appear on any, ele any element. However, they're only applicable to very specific elements. For example, the fill property is one of these. So, typically, properties are things that affect graphic state. So, for example, you might want to send the stroke width at the root element of your SVG document and have that the same all the way down. And that would be that's why it's a property. In contrast, the path description you set in the path element is only specific to that path element. So it's not a property. And as I said before, I refer to attributes and properties as features just to make it clear to distinguish them from XML attributes. Otherwise, things get a bit confusing. OK, so. The first thing you have to do is actually to start the goal of a compiler, I should say, is to basically iteratively lower the level of its input to the output you finally get. And then we need to do the same thing here. We need to take our very high level SVG document with all its complex structure and everything, use nodes, define nodes, properties defined all over the place, attributes defined all over the place. And we need to take that and process it down to a much lower level form, which we can then turn into this meta file kind of format. So it essentially comes down to five phases that you run over the document tree. You first of all want to trim all elements you don't understand, aren't applicable, or are actually uh, written incorrectly. That then reduces the size of your tree a bit. And indeed, SVG requires this because there are certain aspects of it where, because it's designed to be subsetable in the sense that you can implement it, implement a subset of features. If you trim the tree before to the things you understand before you actually go any further, pretty much automatically um, things work in that fallback state. And this is kind of uh, the way they've designed and structured it. So the first thing you do is remove anything you don't understand, anything that's wrong. The next thing you do is go through and you literally pass every single attribute. Remember, XML is a string, uh, is a text-based description. So that means all the values in all the attributes are strings. So they need to be passed into what they are. So for example, transform attributes need to be passed into an actual set of matrices that implement the transform. Colors need to be um, passed into like RGB color values. 
uh, lengths need to be passed to take into account the units, all these kinds of things. So the next phase is you pass the values. You then unpack things that are inline styles. So again, taken from like HTML and CSS world, all elements can have a style attribute. And in the style attribute, you can have properties, which then overlay any attributes that were set on the node itself. And after you've applied the inline styles, you then want to apply any defaults. Um, again, like HTML, SVG pretty much requires you to specify no attributes, and there's always sensible defaults or substituted for required properties. For example, if you don't specify CX and CY for a circle, which is the center point, it will take it to be zero. Now, after you've done that, you need to map, create a map between the IDs in the document to the actual elements they reference. So that's used in the next set, Flatten, where you iterate through your document again, and you, all the use nodes you replace with copies of the element they reference. So again, that the use nodes are used so you can replicate um, uh, groups and elements many, many times in the document and only define them once. Find the final step is cascade. So what you do in the cascade step is that's when you apply all these, these inherited properties to applicable children. So for example, you bubble down things like the fill tribute you may have sent at the root of your document all the way down to all children that don't have it set themselves. That's kind of the, the in SVG without CSS, that's kind of quite simple. Now, if anyone knows anything about CSS, um, you will know that you can actually define CSS style sheets that quite, do quite a lot of complicated pattern matching to work out what to apply where. Um, and Cascade here is a much more simplified version of that. So after you've done all this processing, what you end up with is a much, much, much simpler um, tree, which you can then move on to the next steps. So basically at this point, we now have a tree that has um, a list of elements. There are no use nodes anymore. It's, a, it's basically all the objects, all the elements you want have been replicated appropriately. Every single element in the tree has every single property it requires, um, or every single attribute it requires. They've been set to defaults as necessary. Um, so basically, you, can, you only have to worry about the, the, very, the leaf nodes in your tree, and they have all the details you need to actually be able to render that node. Okay. So what you do to generate the meta file is you iterate over the element tree. You can catenate all the transforms as you see them. For example, my, my group node might specify a transform, then a, a path node in the group might specify a transform. So the transform of that uh, path node within the group is a concatenation of the groups with the path nodes or path elements. You then need to compile the properties that are set on each element to a super representation of objects. So what I mean by that is, for example, um, you want to uh, take the abstract definition of a color and actually make sure you convert it down to like a red, green, and blue values. Or um, you want to take your path string and make sure it's compiled to a super representation that you can actually execute in terms of paths that like move to line to. Now, in this case, and we can cheat a bit here because our Canvas um, library in LCB fully supports uh, SVG path strings. So at the moment, my compiler doesn't have to worry about path strings. It will do it at a later date when we want to um, add gradient support, but I'll come on to that later. Um, <clears throat> so the final, then the next thing is you compute all the path objects and shape element properties. So for example, a circle uh, is defined by a center point and radius. So you need to make sure you record that information appropriately so you can replicate that when you execute it again. Finally, what comes out of this is basically a linear sequence of operations. So here's a, an example of what you get. This is, this is what you get after uh, running the compile set on that, that three circle RDB example. You have kind of, here you see it's basically a sequence of operations, attributes are set. And then because the, attribute, the only attribute that changes between rendering the circles is uh, the fill paint attribute, you can see here there's a lot of um, setup for attributes, the first 10 commands, in fact. And then the rest is basically just a sequence of change the fill color, transform, change the transform, render a circle. Uh, choose the next color, choose the next transform, render another circle. And you also see here the circles are exactly the same. The only thing differs is how they're uh, transformed and how they're painted. Okay, so let's um, talk a bit about the implementation. So the SVG compiler is actually implemented in live code script. It uses RevXML to pass the XML. Um, XML, whilst relatively easy to create a simple parser for, which supports simple XML files, XML itself is actually quite complicated. So we can manage to hide all the details of passing um, all the edge cases, all the complexity of XML by using RevXML. So RevXML basically allows you to iterate over the um, XML tree. Now this is actually quite inconvenient to do anything with because you have to do function calls to everything. So what the first thing the compiler does is actually takes the XML and, and converts it to a live code array. 
So basically, it, it converts an XML node into an array which has a, an array of attributes which map uh, the name of the attribute to the value, has a content um, key which is then a sequence of child elements, and <clears throat> it has a name which is the name of the element. So, for example, an SVG node which has a, a group node as a child will have name SVG in, uh, and a map of attributes in the attributes key, and then um, a single element sequence in the content uh, key, which is the group node. And it turns out this is much, much easier to manipulate um, because things like the fact you can pass parameters by reference or that kind of thing, it's really easy to write recursive procedures that iterate over live code arrays. And it's far easier than calling web XML functions all the time. OK, so the next thing the way compiler is implemented is there's a lot of consistency the way properties and attributes and elements are defined in SVG. Now, I wouldn't say it was a lazy coder exactly, but I certainly don't want to have to sit there and replicate by hand a lot of things which are exactly the same, particularly because that's a really big source of errors. So all the elements, attributes, and properties are actually defined in a very simple specification. So here's an example of how we define element circle. It defines all the attributes that are applicable to the element, and it, it uh, defines which properties are actually applicable to the element. The properties are defined separately in the specification part, but didn't have, time, didn't have space to put everything there, so I just put a, sub, uh, a small part of it. So the first thing the compiler does is it loads the specification, and then it uses this to actually um, work out what to do with attributes. For example, it can turn out, could work out what type they need to be. That means it work out how to pass them. It tells it whether attribute is optional or not, or whether it's required. If it's required, what its default value is. Um, and this basically means it reduces, kind of it gets rid of all the boilerplate code you might have to write otherwise. It also means that at the very least, it's relatively easy to add um, the attribute property um, parts of elements. So you can at least make the compiler understand at least the uh, superficially new elements. Of course, you still have to implement what they do kind of um, after that point, you have to implement all the semantics of them, but at least the actual uh, boilerplate stuff are actually working out what attributes they are and passing those is all done pretty much automatically. Um, the implementation compiler uses by ref parameter to actually pass through the document tree, which I said was an array. So that means we actually mutate it in place, which means it's quite efficient and actually a little bit more convenient than kind of threading through and rebuilding the tree each and every time. It's something I found, I found like it is particularly good at. Um, <clears throat> and so finally, the implementation just outputs the operations as lists. So for example, um, the operation that sets fill color can, is, a, is, a, is two elements. The first is the operation name, which is fill. And the second is the argument to the operation, which is a representation of a color object. So here you see the, the representation of a color object is just a four argument list. Color is the, the, type, of color, the type of paint. And then three values that represent are the red, green, blue values of it. Okay, so I'll just take a brief break there. So, is there any questions? No, there would appear not. Okay. Carry on. Okay, so once you've got past the uh, compilation step, what we have now is a list of operations we want to execute. So we now actually need to uh, work out how we want to execute those. Now, remember the thing that's to get about this, what the idea is that we put all the hard work in the compiler so that we make execution as compact and as efficient as possible. Now, as is common with most things that come out of uh, um, compilers, uh, regardless of the level, there's always still some work to be done at runtime. Now, if with machine code, pretty much most of the work is got been got rid of by the compiler, but there's still some. For example, when you load an application, it needs to load and resolve the dynamic library symbols. Um, <clears throat> but in this case, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of thinking of the output of the SVG compiler as kind of an assembly language, in a sense. It create, it has a, 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 a low level, but still not exact a description of what's to be executed. In particular, operation names are labels, and um, all the objects operate and manipulate, like colors and paths and things, are <clears throat> are kind of uh, data. What you really want to do is convert it into a list which is kind of the handle you want to call and the object you want to pass as an argument. It is particularly um, pertinent to when using the canvas operations in Lyco Builder because um, whenever you create something like a path or a color in Lyco Builder canvas, it will actually only ever create one copy of the same thing. So it doesn't matter how many times you say kind of solid color um, zero, 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 in your code, how many times they're executed, there'll only ever be one instance of the solid color black object. Similarly, if you create a circular path, which is uh, centered at six comma two, 
in the canvas and with radius 100, there'll only ever be one circular path in memory with that. So one thing you can do is to make kind of use of um, SVG or the runtime is much more efficient is to basically, before you execute it, the first time is to go through and actually uh, convert the operation is to go out the compiler into a slight into this form, which is a pair of ha a handler and an object you pass to the handler. So this helps with the memory size problem in terms of you know if like if you've got a thousand different SVG icons, you don't want to end up um, using all your memory just because you decide to use SVG rather than images, um, which could happen if they're particularly complicated and the images are quite small. Um, <clears throat> So what would happen in this case was that you end up only has paying once for any object that's the same. So again, in this case, the, there's a simple process that loops over the operations that come out of the compiler, and um, it turns it into a flat list, which consists of pairs handler, which is would actually perform the operation, and an object past the handler. So in this case, circular path, this is the same as like um, circular path centered at 6,2 with radius 100. And that's a unique object, as I said. So, as already mentioned, the execution part is implemented in Live Code Builder. As assembly simply operates over the operation list, it ends up performing um, a, two, a sequence of two operations like there. It pushes the handler for the operation it's processing onto an operations list, and then it pushes a, uh, a path object onto the operations list. Now, bearing with the thing about the memory here is that as soon as the compiler has done its work and produced the operations list, and then LCB has had its go at it and converted it, all the memory used by the, the uh, operation list produced by the compiler goes. It's only transiently present. Um, so at the end of the day, kind of, you might spend a little bit of time doing all this when the application starts up, but after that point, the only the minimum amount of information will be present for it to actually be able to perform its function. So similarly, kind of the render loop actually becomes really simple after this. It's basically just iterate through the operations list that's been assembled and call the handler with the parameter. Now, there are some few little annoying niggles here because it's because of the way the Canvas um, API works. Um, <clears throat> In general, the operation handles are quite simple. Like for example, when you set the fill color, it, it sets context variable fill. It would be nice if you could call um, a canvas operation to do that, but unfortunately, the canvas only has a single paint, which it uses for stroking and filling, whereas SVG requires a stroke paint and a fill paint. Uh, I'm not quite sure why I made that design decision with the canvas. Um, with hindsight, it makes no sense if you want to support SVG. Although, fortunately, it's something we can actually change. That would actually make the SVG implementation LCB a little, little cleaner. Okay, so let's uh, just briefly talk over kind of the final bit here, which is obviously the goal of here is to produce a widget. So the question is, well, okay, so you've got a bit, which is a, we've got the SV compiler, which is live code script, and we've got the um, the meta file interpreter, which is written in live code builder. Uh, we want to merge the two together and produce a widget. So the question is, how do we do that? Well, the compiler script only stack. We will put we put that in the widgets resources folder. We then use a new bit of syntax that was introduced quite recently um, in DP in 9, if it wasn't 9, DP 8, I think, which is my resources folder. And this allows inside your widget for you to find your resources folder, which is unique to your widget. Um, so then it can use that to find and resolve the compiler. And this code uses the uh, script object syntax in Live Code Builder, which basically allows you to get some called a weak reference to an object. So a weak reference to an object is something which um, doesn't go away until you stop using it, but you can tell by asking that weak reference whether the object is attached to you actually hasn't been deleted or not. So in this case, um, the first time the compiler is needed by the widget, it, it basically tries to resolve the um, compiler stack directly using a uh, resolve script object and my resources folder. Um, and then it can then use that to send it a command, send it a function. In this case, SVG import from text, which is the live code script function which the compiler uses and then converts the SVG text into the description array. Um, and there are a couple of subtleties here. There's only certain, there's some places you can't call anything like code scripty from like a builder. Fortunately, in this instance, it doesn't really matter. You can call live code script stuff when you set a property and you can call live code script stuff on open. And since you don't need the SVG representation until you're about to render it, which, which you always will, which it will always be open beforehand, it doesn't really cause a problem. There's just a wee bit of code in there to defer compilation of um, SVG text that's saved with the widget. Okay, so I'm guessing after all that chat, and hopefully being better to be interesting, um, I'm going to try and give you a quick demo of what um, we have managed to put together. Okay, so um, as I said, this demo is live. Hopefully it will work. It 
worked earlier on, just before this. So hopefully it will work for me now. Okay, so here we have a very simple stack I put together literally 10 minutes before my talk started. Um, it consists of an SVG widget here, or ve sorry, vector icon widget. The name of the thing at the moment, the prototype is vector icon. So we'll find out what the final name should be. Um, and then the script is as simple as this. It asks you to choose an SVG file and it sets the SVG text to the widget. In fact, the SVG, the Victor icon widget only exports one property at the moment and that is SVG text. Okay, so, so we can start off with an Android. So we have um, an Android uh, SVG, seems to work. Uh, anyone like South Park, we have Cartman. Um, there's this quite nice example I found on the web. There's dozens of quite simple SVGs. Well, I say it's quite simple SVGs. I should say there are some, it's a lot of very nice SVGs out there that use simple SVG features, but are still quite complex. So here you can see I can scale this up and down as much as I like. Um, I think this is quite a pretty standard example in a world of SVG that graphics. It's the a lion. I remember seeing this decades ago. I'm sorry, I don't know why I did that. Um, and let's see what else we've got. There's a, a NASA logo. This was apparently translated from an EPS file. It was from Wiki, Wikipedia somewhere. Um, someone's uh, obviously traced the president of the United States seal. Um, here's a simple world map. So you'll notice here this one does not scale when I uh, resize it. So this is something I still need to figure out the exact details of. The SVG files, you can specify a view box attribute on the root element, the SVG root element. And that then defines the area of the um, widget or the area of the SVG that should be scaled into the container. So this world map does not have a view box attribute. So it there's no transformation done when it's rendered into the uh, widget's bounding box. In contrast, as you saw, the um, lion click art, this does have an SVG box attribute, which means it knows the widget knows what area of the SVG surface to actually scale into the bounds of the control. Now, at the end of the day, this is all going to be configurable when the widget's finished. Um, but at the moment, it just basically does the default thing. If there is no view box, it doesn't apply any transform. If there is a view box, it maps the view box into the direction of the widget. I'm turning this down. So there's, oh, here's the tiger. Again, this, this one does have a view box. So we'll scale. So all of these stuff I've just shown then, they're all quite simple SVG. They don't use any advanced SVG features, no gradients or anything like that, just paths and colors. Um, here's an example, this is a, there's a tux logo. Now this looks a bit flat. And that's because it does actually have some features we don't currently support. So if I load, if I look at this in um, Max Preview, for example, you can see that it's kind of got a few gradients and highlights. So, so you, basically what tends to happen is you will get something, even if um, the SVG has features that aren't supported by the current SVG widget, but it may not look quite as good. It will look, it probably look a bit flat because gradients tend to be used quite a lot. Um, so I don't think there's any others in particular interest. The, yeah, the only other ones I've got here for the moment um, is as a product, so the RGB overlap um, kind of widget. So, as I should say, the uh, three examples I said, they were actually rendered with my SVG widget. The three examples I gave SVG originally, like the more complicated ones, they weren't. They were just images I found on Google. Um, they were SVGs. Okay. So, I'll just quickly go back. So, uh, Kevin asks, can you rotate? Um, not yet. However, um, it's only because I haven't implemented that in the widget. Uh, basically, the aim is there will be a transform property of the widget, along with some simplified ones like scale, rotate, and translate, um, which you'll be able to set. And what that will do is that will compute a transform which will apply before it renders the SVG. Um, <clears throat> so again, it, that's, that is something that's relatively easy to add. I just need to work out the exact details of how to make it quite easy to use. Um, but it will. OK. Uh, so yeah, so the rotation transformation of widgets will 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 happen in relatively shortly. Martin asks, can live code script 
um, manipulate features in the original SVG before rendering on the card. Um, <clears throat> so, <laughs> well, no, the, I said the goal of this at the moment is to take an SVG file and compile it for display. You can obviously take the SVG document with Rex or XML, modify it, and then set it. So you could manipulate it um, like that. You can't do quite what you can do in browsers with the JavaScript set elements of um, the, DOM, the document object model nodes and things like that. Uh, why do the I say, Ralph asked, why do the overlap colors look wrong? Uh, I don't think they do. It, this is it's just using a 0.7 opacity in the SVG. Let's see what it looks like in. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> Let me see if it all loads in Chrome. Nope. Okay, I have no idea why nothing else will render that um, example. But I says the, the fill opacity is 0.7, so you won't get the standard mixing you might see when you typically see this, because I think it should be 0.5. Um, okay, let's go back to the middle of the gym. Can you save or store the compiled format? Okay, so at the moment, no. However, the plan is that yes, once I uh, dotted the I's and crossed the T's and made sure that I've got a forward compatible uh, metafile format, then the idea will be you'll actually be able to um, set that format as a binding blob of data directly. And indeed, you'll be able to, she should, we should be able to make it so that when you actually build your application using a standalone builder, it will go through and compile all your SVG for you to that much more compact form. Um, <clears throat> well, compact, it, it's, I'm not sure yet whether how much more compact it will be, certainly SVG, files can contain a lot of information that you don't need to render. Um, so I can actually give an example of that. As I was saying before, one advantage of SVG is because it's XML, um, third party applications can hang as much stuff as they want into the XML tree in a way that will not affect rendering by an SVG renderer. So what you'll see is um, things like Sodipodi and Inkscape um, will have a lot of these uh, attributes and of course they, they, the renderers completely ignore them they're just meaning so you can round trip through Inkscape so if you uh, load into the widget into Inkscape sorry and modify it and save it back out again it will retain all the information it needs to be able to continue to edit it in the same way as it did before um, now if I can find my more deep folder of an example, um, one that I saw that had quite good. So here you go. So here's an example of a presumably something that was ed edited with Inkscape or or Sodi Podi or something. You'll see there's various um, attributes on the XML node. So certainly you can remove quite a lot of information when you compile it. Um, I would expect for most SVGs the encoded form will be quite a bit smaller than the text form. Um, so we can actually do that as a process when you build your application to minimize the size. And also it means you won't have to run the compile compilation step or app startup time. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay, so Baron IA are slightly unrelated. It's intentional SVG if I mouse up, even if the mouse moves outside the icon. Um, so that's actually down to the implementation of the widget. Um, LCB uses a slightly lower level set of messages for mouse, so you need to actually decide whether you want to send mouse up or mouse release when these things happen. So yes, we can make it act however way we wish. Um, can I take an SVG on a button? Um, not yet, no. So a button uh, can only reference an image at the moment. Um, we can certainly look at a couple of things there. There's either the possibility to be able to make a button icon reference any control, in which case it will take the image of the control as its icon. Or we can look at working out, see if we can actually make it so an image object can take an SVG file a bit like, um, <clears throat> a bit like if you have, um, I was going to say, so a bit like at the moment you can actually on Windows set an image object to use a meta file, or you used to be able to, like a, a Windows enhanced meta file or a Mac picked file. So there's a couple of things to think about there. Um, at the moment, I'm focused on trying to get the widget to render more SVG, but there's various ways we can fold it into it. Okay, how else are the Z order of transparent object overlap does matter? Right, no, well, yes, it's it's back to front and it does matter, yes. So in this case, it's, I, I don't, again, I'm not sure what you're expecting, in, Ralph, in terms of what it should look like, but it said the opacity is 0.7. So um, the color you'll see in the middle will be, um, 0.7 red mixed 
oh, it's bad guess about uh, we 0.7 red times 0.7 blue times 0.7 green. Um, so I can actually very easily tweak that um, to do. To, 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 where are we? RGB. You need to find the file. SVG. So if I change the RGB overlap, if we change it to 0.5, reload it, you see it's changed slightly. Okay, so I've just got two more slides. I know I'm running over ever so slightly. I did start slightly late, so hopefully that'll be okay. Um, if I just get my... I will permit you to overrun by a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so just there's a couple of slides left. Okay, so I just need to say a couple more things. Um, again, so at the moment support is somewhat limited. But again, there's lots of SVG files which render perfectly using that what it does have. So essentially, this is the list of things it currently supports. In particular, there's no solid color or gradient support. Um, there is uh, the prototype vector icon widget. It will be available to all LCG attendees. It is under a restricted trial evaluation license, license meaning it's for your own personal use, i.e. no distribution. Um, we, it will be forwarded into product as soon as we can. Like, it will be in the next EP. Um, we just need to decide on the final name and a few other properties and things like that. Um, the, what else was I going to say? Um, the, uh, I'm thinking about setting up a forum to discuss the SVG widget, partly to start collecting SVG files that people would like to render or ones they file they think they should they should render correctly but don't. Um, there is fortunately a lot of example SVG files in the SVG specifications which also have a kind of a reference PNG images attached to them. So I have started not quite finished a little stack that iterates through them and displays them side by side. So that'll help, so that's kind of some kind of element of unit testing on what it does. Um, of course, the, the feature support will take a little longer. Um, but I'm just going to give you an idea of what the current plan with that is. So I need to get a permanent name for the widget. I'm not sure vector icon is quite right, given we have SVG icon already. Um, it's going to be included in the product in one of the nine in the next nine DP, nine DP or being well. Um, I need to make sure I can assure forward compatibility. So at the moment, the widget saves the SVG text you set in the widget uh, state data when you save it in the stack file. Um, it would be better potentially to offer a mode where it didn't preserve it. It restored it in a more kind of uh, simplified, more compact form. But for that, I need to make sure we have a format that will definitely continue to work into the future without any problems. I don't think that's too much, too difficult to do. I just need to sit down and think about it for an hour or two. Um, I also want to split the widget into a widget and library. At the moment, the widget holds some state which isn't really needed per widget. It's just, it's just required by the thing that uh, compiles and renders SVG. So I, I'm going to split that up and that'll make it a little less, a little more efficient. Um, the critical feature we need to put in, I need to put in next is really bounding box computation in the compiler. This is where you compute the bounding box of elements iterating down the tree. The reason we need that is twofold. One is so that it can offer better transformation support in the widget. So you would probably want a mode where you can ask, um, please scale, please my, use my widget transform on the SVG, but around the tight bounding box around the SVG rather than the view box that's specified. View boxes and SVG files seem to be somewhat strange things. They don't seem to always make that much sense. So you need to be able to choose something else to use. The other important thing why bounding box computation is important is the default mode, the way you specify gradients, requires knowing what the object's bounding box the gradient is attached to. Um, that's the wee bit of complexity, which means gradient support wasn't in the first version. Uh, it wasn't until I actually uh, got to the point of I implemented some of the gradient elements and then started looking at some of the SVG file, files and found every single one I found only used this more complicated transformation mode and not the simpler mode. So that was slightly annoying. Um, and the other thing, main thing I need to do next is improve the widget properties. For example, adding a transform property and thinking about how we're going to make it so whether it preserves or doesn't preserve the actual SVG text and whether it stores a, a, a lower level, more compact form or not. But, uh, that's kind of all coming. So watch this space, and hopefully um, it will appear in a, appear in a DP quite soon. DP quite soon. Um, awesome. Thank you, Mark. Uh, there do okay. seem to be some more okay. questions for you, which I will give you about three minutes to answer. Go. Okay. Right. Okay. So. Right. So. I'll, I'll Will you be able to take an image snapshot? 
Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, the, 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 the um, yep. um, probably could even add an even add an, uh, command. Which, your your uh, audio which, is breaking up there. Do, are you fiddling with the mic or something? I'm not touching anything. It was working. Anything. It was working. I think it's. Uh, I think it's uh, I'm not sure. It's something to do with the. It's something to do with the. If I turn if the mic, turn the mic, I might be able to hear you guys. Okay. Well, have have another go at answering that question and see if we we can hang on to you. Can you guys still hear me? Can you guys still hear me? I can hear you now. Heather, can you hear me? Can you nod? Yeah, I can right. hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so yes, you will be able to take yes, you will be able to take that sort of screen. In fact, we can probably make that a library function so you don't need to create a widget in the first place. There, Ralph asks, how can you keep the original aspect ratio? There is a property that you can set on the SVG node, which uh, allows you to specify how aspect ratio should be preserved. And we can also add that as a property on the widget itself, which can override the value that's specified in the SVG. So you will be able to, yes. Because the operation starts with the, the Dave asks, so because the operation starts with the trim, does this mean that it will import SVGs created by Inkscape to finish the design a sketch without first cleaning up the SVG output? Dave, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, the I've tried to make the compiler as close to correct as I can think it in terms of what the SVG specification intends. And basically, because a trim, all the nodes are not understood and incorrect, and all the attributes that are not understood are incorrect before it does any further processing as it's specified in the SVG spec, it means you should be able to throw any SVG document produced by any outputter. And all you, what will happen is if something is slightly wrong or something doesn't support that element, will assume default values will not get rendered. So you will always get some output for any SVG file, assuming the XML structure is correct. Okay, cool. I think is there anything more? Okay, cool. I think, I think that's, that's all the questions. Really so, um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me overrun slightly. Um, the widget will be available very shortly after this talk. I will uh, give it to Heather to put in the resources folder, and I can probably post it on the Slack channel too. Okay, great. Thanks very great. much, guys. And I will see you next Okay. Well, day. actually, Mark, Bye. we're going to see people Bye. again in a few minutes for questions after Kevin's monthly report. So uh, don't forget that. Um, OK, right. I'm going to end this event now. And I will. we will be back in just a couple of minutes with Kevin for the monthly report. Um, Arthur, uh, let me just post that link very, very quickly for you. Um, Oh, God, no. Uh, OK. And I need to end this event and start the next one. So, guys, I'll be right back.